Hello everyone, today I'm presenting my joint work with Sven Zeuken. The financial crisis of 2008 led to the downfall of major financial institutions and triggered a worldwide recession. One very important learning from the crisis was that we should understand the financial system as a network of institutions connected by obligations to pay. Financial distress at one institution can spread through the network and affect many other institutions. This way, financial interconnectedness gives rise to systemic risk or the risk of a financial crisis. The antidote to this problem then seems to be to reduce interconnectedness in the system. And one way how this is achieved is by eliminating cycles in the network through a process called portfolio compression. Let me give you an example. Here we have a financial network that consists of three banks or other financial institutions, A, B, and C. And between those banks, we have liabilities. This means that a bank A owes an amount of 1 to bank B, bank B owes an amount of 2 to bank C, and bank C owes an amount of 3 to bank A. How these contracts were created is not so important. There could be any number of reasons for that. What we do see here is that there is a cycle in the network, and this means that when these liabilities are paid, an amount of 1 will flow from A to B to C and back to A, so A receives its own money back. It may seem reasonable to just eliminate this amount of 1 up front, and this is what we call compression of the cycle ABC by an amount of 1. Of course, this process requires some coordination. In practice, this is facilitated by a financial services provider that would receive data from all the banks and use that to determine the cycle. What's important to note here is that this services provider has no legal force, so each individual bank needs to agree to the compression before it can take place. By the way, in this presentation, I'm only going to talk about compression by cycles. In the paper, we have a more general model where it's possible to compress by arbitrary circulations. So these are types of network flows. So if now this compression is executed, we reduce the amount on each edge by one, and we receive this network. And we have just reduced interconnectedness. And we may expect that this will also reduce systemic risk. Under the 2017 European Market Infrastructure Regulations, banks are actually obliged to have procedures to analyze the possibility to conduct the exercise of portfolio compression. Um, throughout the text, uh, compression is also uh, called a risk mitigation technique. So the regulator seems to have a pretty strong stance that compression reduces systemic risk and it's a good thing, but the problem was that when this regulation was published, there was no research studying whether this is actually the case. And so this is our research question in this paper. We ask, given a specific compression, when is this compression socially beneficial for all banks and what are the involved banks' incentives to agree to it? Because as you may remember, all the banks that are involved in compression need to agree for it to take place. Now one may think that the answers to these questions are trivial and it's just always beneficial for everyone, but prior work th suggests that this may actually not be the case. So if you study the work on network structure and systemic risk, of which there is quite a lot, what you always see is that there tends to be a trade-off that is created by a financial network. On the one hand, banks that are interconnected in a network share losses and this can make a financial system safer. On the other hand, a financial network also creates a possibility for contagion. But in particular, having less of a network is not always better. If we look at the work on portfolio compression itself, there is surprisingly little. So there is some work on algorithms, how to maximize the compressed amount, um, which is not really the question we are asking here. If we look at compression and systemic risk specifically, this is really a new topic. We were actually the first in 2018 in a prior version of this paper to show that compression can be socially detrimental. And we have some very, very simple sufficient conditions, um, but really not a whole lot more. So let me show you our model. The model we're using is uh, a standard model in financial networks designed by Rodgers and Virat in 2013. And I kind of want to introduce this by example. We model a financial network as a graph where the nodes are banks. And um, as I said before, we store the liabilities as edge attributes. And then we have node attributes, which encode the external assets of banks. So we assume that banks have uh, some assets that can be considered cash. Um, 
And um, the way we usually think about these is that there was a world where everyone had large financial assets and then there was an external shock that led to some kind of crisis-like situation. And uh, so the external assets were reduced from a previous state. Now, in our results, we do not argue with the pre-shock values or the distribution of values. So we only need to sh store the post-shock values here. And then we have two other default cost parameters, which are values in 0 and 1. And I'm going to explain what they mean in a moment. Uh, we store these additionally to the financial network. Based on this description, we can compute what banks can actually pay to each other. The payment that each bank I can make to another bank J depends on its total assets or money it has, which again depends on what it gets paid by other banks and the liabilities it has to other banks. And again, I want to go through this by example. There are two simple cases here, and that's bank B and C. Bank B has very high external assets, so its total assets will at least be two, and therefore it's always able to pay these liabilities here. We also say that B is not in default. So default means not being able to pay, and it's not in default. For bank C, it's the same situation, and therefore the two payments here will always be two. Now let's look at bank A. The assets of bank A are 2 because it receives an incoming payment of 2 and it has zero external assets, but its liabilities are 4, so it won't be able to pay that and it is what we say in default. Now what we assume is that default comes at a cost. This might be legal costs, it might be payment delays and so on. The default of a bank is not frictionless. And therefore we assume that according to these two default cost parameters, 50% of the assets are just lost. This means that what the bank can pay out to its creditors ultimately is just an amount of one. And now we assume that this amount after default costs is distributed proportionally to the liabilities. Here the two liabilities are equal and therefore everyone receives an amount of 0 0.5. We mark this with a red circle. Okay, so let's look at bank D we see that D has 3.5 in external assets, receives 0.5 from A, so in total it has 4, and therefore it's not in default, it's just not in default, and can actually pay this amount in full, and bank E ultimately receives this amount of 4 and doesn't have to pay anything, so it's also not in default. By the way, if there's a cycle of defaulting banks in the network, then this becomes a non-trivial fixed point problem, but uh, these people have actually shown that it's always solvable and also basically unique. From these payments, we assume that banks derive a utility equal to their equity. The equity of a bank is what is left of the assets after all the liabilities are paid or zero otherwise, and this is equal to the value that the shareholders derive. Let's uh, see what the equities are. So B has total assets of 2.5 here and liabilities of 2, so the difference is 0.5. C has assets of 4 and liabilities of 2, so the assets are 2. A defaults and therefore has equity of 0. D is not in default but assets the equal liabilities, therefore uh, equity is also 0 here and E has 0 liabilities, so its equity is equal to its assets. And now we can also compute social welfare in the utilitarian sense, which is just the sum of the equities, and this is then 6.5. We can also, in the usual way, define that a compression is a Pareto improvement if it increases the equity of each bank, and we can say that a compression is incentivized if it increases the equity of all banks where the compressed amount, so this is the compressed amount for bank I, is greater than zero. Because as we have seen, all the banks that are somehow involved in the compression need to agree to it, and so it should increase their equity, um, either weakly or strongly. Now I'm going to show you that compression can reduce social welfare, and it will turn out that actually this example is such an example where this can happen. Let's see what happens when we take this cycle here and we compress it. Uh, with an amount of 2. So then we receive this financial network that is very simple, 
these liabilities have all disappeared and we only have this uh, kind of chain left. Let's compute payments in the compressed network. For bank B, it's again very simple. It's not going to default the same for bank C and equity is just equal to external assets because they don't have any uh, contracts. Bank A, again it's going to default. It has zero assets and it can pay nothing. And here we see a difference to above because up here it was able to pay 0 0.5 and now it's able to pay 0 and this is actually going to drive the whole result. So bank D now receives nothing and it's actually going to default because it only has assets of 3.5 and liabilities of 4. We again have default costs of 50% at D so it's only able to pay from these 3.5 an amount of 1.75 and the rest is lost to default costs. Um, and for E it's the same, its equity is reduced and if now we compute social welfare we see that this is reduced as well. If I hide all the numbers that stay the same between the two systems we can see a bit better what's going on here. In the uncompressed system bank A is supported by the payment it receives from bank C or equivalently the losses at bank A are shared between bank B and bank D. Um, Whereas in the compressed system, the losses of bank A are borne completely by bank D. And this is actually socially worse um, because it creates losses downstream for banks D and E. So compression gives rise here to this phenomenon of loss sharing versus contagion and there seems to be a trade-off. Now, what we are thinking about is why does this really happen um, in this particular instance? And one thing that we noticed is that um, the situations of the banks involved in the cycle here are very different. So bank A has a very poor financial position, it's very poorly capitalized, whereas banks B and C are very well capitalized. Um, and actually we were able to turn this into a theorem stating the following. If each bank that is involved in the compression, so that has a positive compressed amount, has um, its external assets in relationship to the compressed liabilities above a certain threshold that depends on the default cost parameters, then the compression is a Pareto improvement. So it's uh, not only welfare improvement, but it's actually improving the equity of each individual bank individually uh, in a weak sense. What we're saying here is that compression is a good idea when all banks are in a relatively strong position and this goes against the story we are usually telling about compression, which is that we are removing interconnections to eliminate this contagion and to isolate strong banks from weak banks. So um, there seems to be a bit more to it than this. In the paper, we have further sufficient conditions. For example, we show that um, not only is compression a Pareto improvement when all banks are in a strong position, but also when they are in very homogeneous or similar positions asset and liability wise. So it doesn't have to be all strong, just needs to be similar enough. And we also provide some sufficient conditions on the structure of the compression itself. And I want to talk about our second research question regarding banks incentives to compress. And going back to our example from before, we can see that this compression is incentivized. And we can just do this by comparing equities. Bank A has uh, the same equity as before after compression. Bank C also has the same equity as before. And Bank B actually increases its equity. So all of these three banks will agree to compression. And this is the case even though social welfare here, here decreases. So here incentives to compress are misaligned with social welfare. The reason why this happens is that if we look at this kind of tail here where most of the welfare is lost, there is no path of liabilities that goes back to any of the banks in the cycle here. So the banks in the cycle in a sense only need to care about themselves and not about other banks. And it will actually turn out that whenever a financial system has a structure like that, then compression is always incentivized. We have a theorem on that. It reads as follows. If a financial system is normal, and there are no feedback paths, then compression is incentivized. Now being normal is a technical condition that's required when we do compression with several cycles at the same time. If we only do compression with a single cycle, it's always satisfied. So I'm not going to go into detail here. 
And a feedback path is the following structure. A feedback path is a path of liabilities where the compressed amount is zero. And that goes from the set of banks involved in the compression back to itself. If we look at our example, we see that no such path is there because the only liabilities that are not compressed are these ones and the set of involved banks is this one. And of course, there's no path that goes back from the set to itself. Once more, going back to our example, we can use this insight to construct a financial system where compression is not incentivized. And what we do is we take this bank E that suffers from compression and we take this bank C that is part of the compression but is indifferent and we identify them to receive this financial system. Now the equities here are just added up from before and so bank C now has an equity of 6 before after has an equity of 3.75 and so C would not agree to this compression and it's not incentivized. Interestingly, bank C would not agree at the cost of bank B, which actually has a lower equity here. So there's an interesting maybe incentive misalignment here again. Of course, the feedback path we should now have is this one from A to D and back to C, which is the reason why C would be interested in actually supporting A and not compress. To conclude, today I have talked about portfolio compression, which is the elimination of cycles in financial networks. I have shown that contrary to conventional wisdom, portfolio compression is not always beneficial for everyone, but there is a trade-off between loss sharing and contagion. I have shown to you that we can find sufficient conditions under which compression is a Pareto improvement, and I have shown to you that the incentives to compress for banks depend on the presence of feedback paths in the network. I briefly want to talk about two pieces of future work. One might include in the model some additional benefits banks derive from compression, for example, due to reduced capital constraints. We have briefly checked this in a very simple extension and there, there was no qualitative change, but only some quantitative change to our results. And the other one is to take an ex-ante view and assume that banks are somehow maximizing expected equity subject to a distribution of shocks. Now, these types of results are notoriously hard to achieve in financial networks and would likely require new methods compared to what we have done here. Thank you very much for your attention.